Good morning, church. Another blessed Sunday morning, and uh, we're glad you can be with us today. I hope you are well. Uh, I wanted to look at, uh, really, uh, the cost of discipleship today. Uh, what does it cost to be a disciple of Jesus? Uh, there's no such thing as cheap discipleship. There's no such thing as cheap salvation. And I want to look this morning at Luke chapter 14, beginning verse 25. It says, Now great multitudes went with him. And here he is, Jesus has these great crowds thronging him in his ministry. He says, And he turned and said to them, So as they're following, he turns and addresses them. If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. For which of you, intending to build a tower, does not sit down first and count the cost where he has enough to finish it? Lest, after he has laid the foundation and is not able to finish it, all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Or what king, going to make war against another king, does not sit down first and consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, while the other is still a great way off, he sends a delegation and asks for the conditions of peace. Likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for land nor for the dung, but men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Father, this is one of those passages of scriptures that's sort of harsh to our ears in modern America. It, it can be a little difficult. But Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, make your word come alive. Give us understanding in our minds, in our hearts, and let us grow from this passage of Scripture. Lord, you just teach us by your Holy Spirit and by the power of your word what you'd have us to learn this morning. But don't let us be forgetful hearers, but faithful doers of your word, for we will be blessed in the doing, in the obeying of your word. I pray especially for those listening this morning that have not accepted Jesus Christ personally and publicly as our Lord and Savior, that you'll convict them about their need to do that thing this very hour. Be with the rest of us who need to make other spiritual decisions. For your honor and for your glory, let Jesus Christ be lifted up. In his name I pray. Amen. In our Baptist hymnal, we have a song that we sing. It's called, The Way of the Cross Leads Home. Verse 1 says, I must needs go home by the way of the cross. There's no other way but this. I shall ne'er get sight of the gates of light if the way of the cross leads home. <clears throat> I've got the wrong tune. The chorus. The way of the cross leads home. The way of the cross leads home. It is sweet to know as I onward go, and I'm off key, the way of the cross leads home. Now, I'm afraid we sing that sometimes without really realizing what the words say. The way of the cross leads home. No one comes to Jesus except by the way of the cross. We bow at the foot of his cross and surrender to him or we don't come at all. And the way of the cross was not just some little precious ornament we put on a chain or a necklace or uh, a bracelet. Uh, the way of the cross was a way of death. And for us, it means death to self, death to ambition, death to pride, death to the old sinful man. You see, the cross of Christ challenges us to genuine commitment to Him. 
genuine commitment to him. Not lip service, not mental assertion of who he is, but something that happens that God makes us a new person on the inside that changes us and our actions, our attitudes, our desires on the outside. And it's that challenge of Jesus' cross to genuine commitment. That is the cost of discipleship. Notice in verses 25 and 27, first of all, the cannots. Jesus listed several cannots here. And he says it this way. Now great multitudes went with him and he turned and he said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his father and mother, wife and children, brothers and sisters, yes, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whoever does not bear his cross and come after me, he cannot be his disciple, my disciple. And he goes through and lists some others down through here. Okay, likewise, whoever of you does not forsake all that he has, in verse 33, cannot be my disciple. These are the cannots of discipleship. They're hard. They're hard sayings. And so, what I want to realize, first of all, is this, is that Jesus' purpose for discipleship, I think here, is given in the form of a hyperbole. Now, if I understand the hyperbole, that's a big fancy word, it means a deliberately harsh statement. It does not mean it's not true. It does not mean that it's not serious. It means that it's harsh to get our attention. So why is Jesus saying these things? Here these great crowds are flocking to him. Some because of the miracle. Some because he fed them. Some because they don't think anybody else can speak God's word like he can. He's their favorite preacher. But they're just shallow. They're just falling in line because it's the popular thing to do. And Jesus turning and addressing him gives these deliberately harsh statements so that they will count the cost. Okay, so that basically he's stating a, a spiritual truth and uh, one of the commentators says this was it. It's, it's the principle of self-renunciation. The principle of self-renunciation. You see, of all the loyalties of life, of all the motives of life, of all the things, the desires of life, they need to pale in comparison to Jesus. Did he literally mean to hate your mother and your father and your Brothers and sisters, no. The Bible is full of uh, teachings on the family that you love your family, you take care of your family, you look out for your family. So it's a hyperbole, it's harsh, that in comparison to Christ and our love for Him, it fades. Do we hate our own life also? Well, didn't He the one that said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul and all your strength, and your neighbor as yourself? So again, it's a deliberately harsh statement. It means that I renounce all for Jesus. He's my supreme Lord and Savior. Henry Blackaby stated it this way. Okay, we're either self-centered or we're God-centered. We can look at our lives and and I look at some that claim to be Christians and I'm not trying to judge, but their idea of Christianity is whatever benefits self. It's what makes them happy. It's what suits them at the moment. It's what's convenient for them. It's not the hard sayings of Jesus. It's not the sacrificing. It's not the suffering. It's not the things that I see spelled out in Scripture of discipleship. Of giving self. Jesus said if we try to save our life, we lose it. But if we lose our life for him and his kingdom, we save it. And there are some that want to rebel against that and say, that's not my idea of God or Christianity. Well, you better read your New Testament. Because he said, if you're not willing to do these type of things, there are some cannots. You can't do it without taking up your cross and following him daily and dying to self daily you can't be his disciple and when you truly accepted christ 
There's such a love for him that no sacrifice is too great. There's such a love for him that everything pales in comparison. Is it worth it? Yes. Is there joy in Christian living? Yes. Is there a peace that passes understanding in the midst of trials and suffering? Yes. Hallelujah. But see, there are too many that the first hint of trouble, they want to bail, jump off ship. That's why Jesus had turned to this crowd and said, Are you willing to really follow me? Are you willing to really renounce self and take up your cross and follow me? If not, you cannot be my disciple. Are we willing to give up things? It's not that he'll ask us to, but if he does, he expects us to. And let me show you something. You never give up anything that God doesn't bless you with something better. I'm going to say that again. You never give up anything that God doesn't bless you with something better. Not one thing. Do we understand that? We need to. We need to ask what would keep us from surrendering to God in a way that that makes us not want to give up something for Jesus? See, what is the hang-up about it that keeps us from accepting Christ publicly as Lord and Savior? What's the hang-up that 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 we surrender all? What's the hang-up that 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 he becomes not just the savior of our life, but he demands to be the Lord, the boss of our life. That, that we take everything before him and surrender it to him. What's, what's there other than pride? What's there other than selfishness that keeps us from doing that? But listen, Jesus was serious as a snake in your bed when he said, if you're not willing to do these things, you cannot be my disciple. Now, if you don't think a snake in your bed is serious, something is wrong with you, and we need to have a talk. We need to understand that when Jesus asks us to do something, oh, I couldn't do that, but we can do all these other things that require more time or more money, something's wrong. You see, when, when we say, oh, I don't want people to think of me that way. You know, they think I'm some kind of religious nut, Brother Gary, and a Bible thumper, and narrow-minded. And yet we'll get up and argue our point for some kind of freedom, some kind of right we have. And everybody thinks we're already a, a nut. Oh, I couldn't be that bold as, uh, as to talk to people about Jesus, but we can get to a baseball game or when they let us have basketball games, we can yell and scream and holler, and everybody wonders, who is that loud mouth? Ooh, that was a little harsh. I'm sorry. But you see, don't miss out on all the blessings of following Christ because you're not willing to surrender the cannots. Then he gives us some considerations. Look at verses 28 through 35, the consideration. He says, For which of you intending to build a tower does not sit down first and count the cost? That's what he's trying to get them to do and what he wants us to do. Count the cost, whether he, he, he has enough to finish it. Last, after he laid the foundation, he's not able to finish all. And all who see it began to mock him, saying, This man began to build, was not able to finish. Or what king going to make war against another king does not sit down first to consider whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? Or else, uh, while the other is still a great wall, if he sends for a delegation and asks the conditions of peace. So likewise, whoever you does not forsake all that he has cannot be my disciple. Salt is good, but if salt is lost, its flavor, how shall it be seasoned, is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. But men throw it out. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Now, when I talk about the consideration, the first thing I want us to focus on is what Jesus is not saying. He's not saying, if you can't finish, don't start. We'll say that again. He's not saying if you can't finish, don't start. Because none of us on our own, in our own power, can finish. That's why he gives us the Word of God and the Spirit of God to live the Christian life. See, 
Jesus never backs down from making high demands of his disciples. He doesn't apologize. He doesn't back up. He lays it out there and expects us to do it in his power. But see, that's exactly the point. He provides the help that we need. He says, you count the cross, but listen, I'm going to help you. He don't want us to be surprised. You know, some people think you accept Christ and they paint this picture, all life is rosy. You have enough faith. Everything is just, you know, you plant $10, you'll get 100 You know, God may want you to plant the $10, but that may be your reward of seeing what the $10 does. If you have faith in God, then you won't bail. If you have faith, true faith in God, then you won't be disappointed. But it does not mean that hard times, difficult times, troubled times don't come upon God's very best chosen people. Some of the best Christians I have known through the years have had cancer, have had financial setbacks, have had emotional problems, have had family members leave. Those are hard times and hard things. And he wants us to consider it, but he's not saying don't start if you can't finish. He's saying be aware. How does the book of James say it? Count it all joy, my brethren, when you fall into various kinds of trials. And various means multifaceted, multidimensional. It means that it's just one thing after another. That's life. Even with Jesus. But he's always right there. Because he's the God of all comfort. Who comforts us in all tribulation. That we may be able to comfort others. With the same comfort with which we were comforted. As Romans 8 says. We know all things work together for good. To those who love the Lord. And are called according to his purpose. And that purpose is to be conformed. To the image of Jesus. You see. So if he's not saying don't start. What is he saying? He's saying submission. To him is the key. See, one when, when, when a guy's building a tower, he sits down. Does he have enough to finish the building project? Well, he better. And, and so we sit down, we count the cost. Well, I can't do it, but I can do it with Jesus. And then, you know, submitting to him is like one king preparing to go with war with another. He only has 10,000 troops. The other guy has 20. Can he... Win the battle in two to one odds? If not, it says he sends for a delegation and sues for peace. Well, there's a problem there. God doesn't tell Christians to sue for peace because our main adversary is the devil. And Ephesians 6.12 tells us that we fight not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness in high places. And therefore, we're to put on the whole armor of God. But see, never do I find it where the Bible says we as Christians sue the world for peace. A church that is at peace with the world is a social club. A church that does not hold on to God's word is not a church. And you need to understand by our very presence, if we're obeying God's word, I'm not saying we condemn the world. I'm not saying we judge the world. But the world is judged by the church's very present. When the church is doing what Jesus Christ said, they're convicted of their sin. They, they feel judged. And therefore, they don't like the church. And they don't like Christians. Even if we're a loving bunch of folks, it makes them nervous. But we're not to sue for peace. No. Jesus said, upon this rock I'll build my church. I think he pointed to himself. And the gates of hell would not prevail against the church. Gates are defensive things. The church isn't supposed to huddle up in holy huddles and say, Oh, we're just trying to keep the doors open. No. We bust out the doors and we go attack the very strongholds in our communities to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Do we understand that? See, discipleship may cost us a job promotion or a job if somebody knows we're really on fire for Christ. Uh, It may cost a politician an election. It may cost a young person social acceptance. But see, either we seek the lost and we seek uh, to honor Christ or we sue the world for peace. (laughs) And then the third point isn't just um, 
the cannots or the consideration, it's the consequences. What happens if we sue the world for peace? Verse 34 and 35 tells us that. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It is neither fit for the land nor for the dunghill. But men, throw it out. He has ears to hear. Let him hear. Here's the consequence. We're either useful for Jesus or useless to Jesus. Useful for Jesus, useless to Jesus. That's a hard thing. We need to understand that the salt in Jesus' day wasn't the purified salt that we have now. A lot of it was from the Dead Sea. It had lots of impurities and sometimes dirt and other things in it. And, and it could literally not have enough salt to have saltiness. But when it got to that point, it wasn't good to preserve food. It wasn't good to add a distinct flavor. It, it, it wasn't even good uh, in small amounts for, for fertilizer, for the land to help it grow. People just, you would walk down the streets of different villages and there would be a, a little pile of gray looking stuff and it was somebody's old salt that was no longer any good. It, it wasn't good for anything to be trampled under the foot of men. And those who claim to be Christians but won't meet the demands of discipleship, those who claim to be Christians but won't honor the word of God, those who claim to be Christians but have lost their witness because they accept anything, anybody, anybody, anytime against the word of God, have lost their saltiness. Christ can't use them. Now, I want you to hear very carefully. I'm not saying I want to judge people. I'm not saying I'm going to look by my nose at people. I'm not going to be fair sacral at people. I cannot say, oh, you're such an awful sinner. I'm a sinner saved by grace. I still have sins in my life that I have to struggle with, that I have to confess, that I have to fight. All of us do. Get a hold of it, Christian. We're all in the same boat. But I am saying that we're to strive. We're to consider the demands of discipleship. We're to study our Bibles. We're to pray. We're to learn to witness. We are to serve in our communities. I had the experience in college that I went to a large church there in Hot Springs, and they, uh, the pastor wanted me to get a taste for missions, and he put me on the mission committee, and I was, oh, I was disappointed. It didn't take but a few meetings, about six meetings once a month, that I decided that I'd had all the missions committee I wanted. They had absolutely, now hear me, they had absolutely no vision to do any kind of mission work in the community. At that time, I was going out and visiting on Saturdays for the bus children that we brought in, about 60, anywhere from 65 to 80 bus kids on two different buses. Okay? They had no interest in that. They said, look, that just takes a bunch of resources away that we could be doing real missions with, which upset me. I was even in there for what they called children's worship at that time, children's church, trying to teach those wild children what it was about so that once a month we would come in and, and we would sit on the front two rows and listen to the pastor as he proclaimed the gospel of Jesus. They didn't care about uh, feeding people or having a clothes closet. They, didn't, they, didn't, they just didn't care about local missions at all. They were all about going overseas. Oh, come on now, Gary, vote with us. We'll, we'll help you get overseas. And, and I never have gotten to do that, and I, I regret not having to do that. But I, I could not see living one way in America and going and being sanctimonious missionaries in another area. I thought at one time God might be calling me to be a missionary. And my mother-in-law put it in direct perspective. Gary, unless you're winning all the souls you can here, God is not calling you to be a missionary. He's calling you to be a missionary where he has placed you in the church. That was good advice. You see, the whole point boils down to this. The whole point is that professed discipleship without total commitment is false commitment. If you're not totally committed, you're falsely. The positive consequences, when we strive as disciples, when we're committed to Christ, God works in great ways. God uses us in ways we never would have believed. God does things through the church that nobody else could do because he's got a God-sized work for each church to do. And we need to get on board. And at the end of life, 
it should look like that our greatest love was Jesus Christ. Our greatest love was Jesus Christ. And if that's the truth, we will hear those words that every disciple wants to hear. Well done, good and faithful servant. You've been faithful in little, coming to the rest which you prepared for you. Amen. So, what kind of discipleship are we practicing? Easy believism or commitment? All out commitment to Jesus. Have a good afternoon. We'll see you next time.